My name's Annie Cattrall and I'm a visual artist. I don't work in any specific materials. I tend to kind of work in film, drawing, sculpture. One of the, um, one of the things I don't do is I generally don't paint. So I'm a visual artist and, um, and I, don't, I don't write. Um, I make things generally. Uh, I'm originally from Scotland where I was born in Glasgow and I was brought up in Edinburgh and went to Glasgow School of Art when I was 18. Studied there for four years and then after that I went over to the University of Ulster where I studied an MA in Fine Art. A kind of normal day for me is, 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 is that every, actually every day is different to be honest. Um, I have quite a lot of different projects on the go at once um, and then I work a bit where I teach at the RCA, the Royal College of Art, which is in Battersea. And some of the installations I've done, uh, completed in the past, some of them have been in galleries, so they're perhaps on show for maybe three weeks to six weeks, for example. So for the Spellbound exhibition at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, I was trying to sort of imagine how I could bring in ideas about early modern witchcraft, um, which was a kind of new territory for me. And I felt very strongly about it. The more I spoke to Malcolm Gaskell about his research, the more I realised how relevant it was to today. And that idea of witchcraft um, still feels very relevant. So I was trying to think of a metaphor of, of something that I could use to begin to explore the idea of accusation and how women um, would be considered to be witches. And who, who decided that? And why did that come about? And um, I was looking at some of the early prints um, in the Cambridge University that we saw of witches. And they were, they were very um, unfair, put it like that. They made out the women to be kind of over the hill, as it were, or kind of like as if they're, they were no longer of value to society. And so it got me quite angry, actually. Um, and I thought, well, I actually feel quite inflamed by this. I mean, I feel the anger felt quite hot, as it were, and I, um, as you can do. And I thought, well, what can I do with that anger? What can I do on that on behalf of these people who were accused of being witches? Um, and I just suddenly thought, I started looking at flames on a very kind of direct level, I just thought I'd got to find something that embodies that emotional intensity. And so what I did was I worked um, with a very good um, film editor, Suki Best, and we, we filmed flames and we edited them. But actually I made the decision to take the colour out of the film so that you could just see the structure of the flames. So it became a black and white film. For a long time we were using the colour and then I just thought that's still rooted in the idea of the flame and what I was trying to do is think of the flame or the um, different states of the flame um, as a structure and there's a durational part of it and it kind of told a story um, it wasn't a narrated story it was a story of the behavior it started off with um, me lighting a candle and then that kind of escalating into something which was really fierce kind of almost like flame throwing and then it being kind of overwhelming and the screen which had hitherto been this um, quite dark contrast to the flame and the fire and then it became almost white, white out with all the kind of intensity of the smoke and the fire and then through that this kind of emerged a kind of almost like after the storm kind of feeling of this kind of calmness and then it suddenly started there's a sort of flicker which alluded to um, I suppose more of something which is to do with witchcraft in a way. So people would come in and sit in Spellbound in the exhibition and I had a chamber which was really built for me by the architect which was great and um, you could kind of experience this in a, in a sort of quiet space um, on, on your own or maybe with two other people because there was a bench. Um, so um, I met a young neuroscientist called Morten Kringelbach and he had been doing a lot of research into the relationship of pleasure and pain within the brain 
and how we experienced that. And he worked with um, neurosurgeons. With um, I went and observed the the um, neurosurgery at the Radcliffe with the permission of the patients. Um, so I went and observed and watched the process happening. And I know that's not everybody's kind of would be interested in that, but again, I think it's a bit like going to the, um, a project I'm going to do next year in the Outer Hebrides. I quite like to go there to find out, to see it for myself, get the first-hand experience, see how I feel. And I felt, you know, quite faint in there. Um, I felt the um, operating theatres are very cold. I hadn't anticipated that. Um, you have to be very still and quiet. Um, and then I made another piece with him, which was actually um, called um, Pleasure Pain, which was about mapping pain and pleasure in the brain. And that was um, done using other kind of m uh, mapping, um, which was electromagnetic. And um, so we made a sculpture called Pleasure Pain, and that again has been exhibited around. But other work I've made, which is to do with the body and the kind of, um, the fact that we are made up of all sorts of different things, including water and air and oxygen and all different sort of ingredients, is was called capacity. And it's a set of glass lungs that I blew um, and then fused together. It's used this glass which is called Pyrex or borosilicate. It's the kind of glass that you'd, you'd, you'd get if you have a coffee pot. So it's very thin, um, chemists use it, you know, scientists use it. And um, it's used for experimentation purposes. And so I've made it, uh, use it, you know, to make this sculpture of the lungs. But other ones are public art and that's a slightly different thing and it's another way that I make, make a living is out of doing public art. Um, and what that is essentially is that when a new building is built or refurbished in a certain way where there's a new element to it, there's a planning um, element to it where you have to, as a developer, have public art. It's called um, Section 106 planning, which is kind of, you know, so it's integrated into what's required of a developer. Um, that they have to have that to get through a planning process. So luckily for me, I enjoy that process of making work for a particular place. And last year I finished um, 2018 two pieces, one at Anglia Ruskin University, which had a kinetic element to it in the sense that it, um, it was called Transformation and it was a new science centre and um, it actually moves in the wind. It's made of, of squares, which I've got some examples in the studio. And, um, and then the other one was actually in Inverness. And it was casting either side of the two tectonic plates that make up the Highland region and the, uh, the lower part of Scotland. So there's this kind of uh, bit which is essentially Loch Ness, where the Loch Ness monster is. And so we cast, either, when I say we, me and an assistant, uh, we cast either side of the geology and then cast that into resin, which is a kind of resin that you'd make a boat with, for example. And then now that is situated in the middle of Inverness for it, it forever, well, as long as it lasts, but it, it should last for a very long time. And it's called Seer and it's based on the kind of Gallic idea of looking into the future. So the two tectonic plates are either side and you stand in the middle of them and your hands touch either side and you almost become that space where you can envisage the future or make a wish or something. So I was in a way, I was trying to embed the idea of having a new tradition in Inverness, that you would go there and do that. And I've, I don't know if that's happened yet. Um, I shall find out when I get some more feedback. And then when I leave a public art work in a place, um, I don't know what's happening to it night or day. So it has its own life. Um, another piece I made for Oxford Brookes University, um, which was suspended from the ceiling in an atrium space, um, when we were installing it, which was quite a tricky job, um, there was all sorts of people tweeting about it and saying that there was the kind of 
um, a UFO coming in and oh, I mean, it was a joke but it was quite interesting the kind of ramifications of making a piece of work in a public, public environment that occupies a space. I have a studio which is in Deptford uh, in South London and it's about a, a half an hour cycle or 20 minute drive and it's in an old factory uh, which is run by an organisation called ACME which has been running for a very long time and was started to up, I think it's 40 years old, and it was started up in the 70s um, to provide um, affordable and um, safe studios for artists. So they're quite sort of basic in some ways. They're not centrally heated and, um, you know, they're not double glazed. However, what's great about them is that you can make a mess. Um, you can't do anything risky but you can certainly use plaster, you can, um, I, I use a torch for glass blowing and things. Um, you can make a noise which is quite difficult in other areas. You know you can drill things, you can use an angle grinder uh, if you've got one. Um, you can also play loud music if you so wish. Um, so when I go to the studio in the morning, I like to work in daylight. Some people I know work all night. Uh, I prefer working in the daylight hours. Um, when I get there, um, it's um, got very high ceiling. I've got a mezzanine floor, which has all my kind of, a lot of my storage in it. Um, although at the moment, my studio is in, a situ is in a state where I'm actually going through all my boxes of stuff because I've just finished a whole load of projects and I need to kind of evaluate what I've done. So I've made a piece of work, I've left it somewhere, I've driven home or I've arrived back with all this kind of stuff which is the stuff of the making of the work often or at least the installing of it. So I'm just in the process of going through that before I start making some new work. In the studio um, I'll be there all day and sometimes if I'm really getting lost in it, as it were, and I don't have any other obligations in the evening. I might work till 10 at night. I might. Um, then I'm pretty tired, actually. I get home and I, I have to kind of unwind and, um, you know, and often it can be quite dirty in the studio if I'm using all sorts of different materials. I have to change and maybe, maybe kind of get into the more domestic way of thinking again. I was just thinking about the studio as well when I was in it yesterday and what I can almost feel when I walk through the threshold of the door, I become something else. I feel like I enter into it, my space. So although it's a, it's a studio and it's just, if anybody else walked in, they just think it's a load of stuff, which, you know, is interesting. But for me, I've kind of push, positioned everything in a kind of order so that I know what needs to be dealt with, what's where, how I, so it's a spatial thing, so it's almost like a kind of mental mapping, but it's a physical, becomes physical. And, um, and I suppose that's why I'm so interested in sculpture and installation. I think often when you're making work, I've found that you kind of have to almost um, listen to your intuition a bit, as well as what your mind tells you. You also need to think, is that right for me? Is that what I'm interested in? You've got a wonderful project. And when I read it, I thought that's, that's so kind of uh, interesting in relationship to how I might go about a project. And I thought to myself, what would I do if I was asked those kind of questions? And sometimes um, I go on the right track, as it were, on the clear track, along the main road, the main motorway, as it were, using it as a metaphor. And then suddenly I can go perhaps on a side road and then down a canal I'm talking about this metaphorically, I'm not saying that I physically necessarily do that, but and then go into a small place and then maybe go into a territory of the unknown, perhaps, or unknown to me, maybe not to somebody else, but unknown to me. And that kind of idea of how you map something out, how you follow a hunch, I always find a very exciting part of research and that could be even actually into a archive, for example. Just even just seeing the actual texture and the handwriting we're so used to seeing things digitally now and to see something as it were in the flesh is gives you so much more to the kind of authorship of how somebody might have written something 
um, how they might have been feeling at the time, the pressure of the ink on the paper, the kind of bleeding of the ink on the parchment or on the old fashioned paper or the old um, paper that they'd have used at the time. Even the smell of it actually is often something which is quite interesting. You know, I've been really, really, really fortunate to have gone all sorts of places in the name of me researching for art, you know, watching brain surgery, you know, going down a mine, you know, going up an, a, a mountain. I always bring things home, even if it's a stone or a feather or, or some kind of anything. I'm always dragging things home. I've got far too much stuff. And I kind of breathe it in, as it were. I breathe it into my head, into my, you know, I touch it, work out how it was made, think about if that might be a process that I might be interested in, or maybe take a photograph of it. Um, and then I sort of let it lie for a bit. I think like any kind of good food or alcohol or anything, things have to be slightly distilled or left to cool. You know, you, you have the ingredients for a cake, you put it in the oven, you don't just break it out. And you've got to wait till it goes to the right temperature or for the right occasion. So things have t time as a big element, I think, in making work. Um, sometimes you don't always have time, um, but because I've been doing this for quite a while now, um, I've actually got notebooks which are full of my ideas. And sometimes when I'm stuck with the kind of white page of what to do next, I sometimes go back to the notebooks and I kind of look at them and I remind myself of a train of thought that perhaps isn't immediately sort of in my forefront of my memory. And then I kind of think, oh, maybe that could be part of, I could use that for this project or I could kind of incorporate that approach. Maybe not the subject matter, but maybe the approach. And then I remind myself of that because we all come up against hurdles. And I think the most important thing is to not see it, you know, it's not see it as a problem, seeing it as a challenge. So nothing is ever lost and, um, it's just perhaps that you have to edit. And a, a big part of what I do is because I get quite stimulated by information or by going to somewhere, I can see all sorts of possibilities and it opens something up in my mind. Um, but then I have to kind of make decisions about what I'll take next. And that making decisions is very much part of the process and something you can't really force. Um, one of the things I've notice through time is often your first instinct is, is the right one. The thing that you notice and you think that's great. I always try to um, tap into where I feel excited about a project, even if it's something that is just minuscule within the project. Um, just why am I so, why does that make me think that that's important? because the, the really important thing should be this, but I'm not feeling that actually. I'm not actually feeling that, that, that thing I should be feeling. I'm actually noticing this little tiny thing in the corner that's kind of bugging me and I'm looking at it and thinking, that's interesting. I, I need to know more about that. I, I like intoxicants. <laughs> um, they always pay, they always help and lubricate and all sorts of things. Um, I, I, I love these new chocolates that everybody, that, that Lint is producing and other people, ones with salt in chocolate and orange and raspberries. There was one I tried not so long ago. I like whiskey, being Scottish. And um, some generous person gave me a bottle of one called Scapa, which is from Orkney. And uh, that is absolutely beautiful. So I'm also kind of aware of how close altered states or people's, um, how important it can be to get yourself into the state of mind to be creative. I mean, I love drinking coffee before I start. Um, it helps a lot. It feels like it's like a, a mental um, cold shower <laughs> or stimulant anyway. Um, some people, when they, when they make work, they have to smoke. Um, I unfortunately don't, but um, I have my habits in, in the, which are not to do with ingesting things, but they're maybe to do with kind of positioning things so that things have to be done in a particular way. Um, I mean, I suppose I'm a believer in that you can do it without intoxicants or serious ones, um, but sometimes you need help to, or, you know, a rest, a coffee, 
um, a bit of chocolate or whatever you um, can can kind of contribute to giving you a new lease of life when you need it. 